I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books, in collaboration with Masterpiece, is thrilled to be here with creator, writer, and executive producer of Grantchester, Daisy Coulomb, discussing the much anticipated season eight of Grantchester. Originally based on a series of books by James Runsey, Grantchester has become a summer viewing staple. Grantchester season eight will air on Masterpiece Mystery on PBS beginning on Sunday, July 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Set in Cambridgeshire, Vicar Will Davenport and Detective Jordy Keating continue to solve mysteries and fight crime. Let's take a moment to watch the trailer. <laughs> If he was angry, if he was wild, would he have it in him to hurt someone? Right, you could leave this to us. Don't worry. We want to help. That won't be necessary. Well, we know when we're not wanted. I'll take my roasting tray if you don't want it. Staging a protest isn't a crime. No, but whipping your top off in public is. Bloody man. She saw you with a gentleman. You will never understand, Bonnie, because we are very different people. I have faith and you don't. Stop vickering me. Vicar would say trust in God. Oh, which is of no bloody use. What if he doesn't want me, Kat? Oh, God still loves you very much, Will. You go out there, Geordie Keating, and you do not come back till you find him. What did you find? I'll go take a look. God's on your side. We all are. Scone? No, thank you. Mikasa, Asukasa. The law's the law, Mr. Palmer. And I don't speak French. I just wish people would believe me when I say that I'm okay. You are better than this. Maybe I'm not as good as you think. As a reminder, season eight of Grantchester premieres on Sunday, July 8th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but check your local listing. Today, we are here to speak with Daisy Coulomb, the brilliant creator of Grantchester. So the moment you've been waiting for, Daisy Coulomb is the creator, writer, and executive producer of Grantchester, which is now in its eighth season. Daisy also wrote and created Deadwater Fell, a four-part psychological thriller starring David Tennant and has written for numerous other shows including Humans and Death in Paradise. It is my extraordinary pleasure to welcome Daisy. Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is very exciting. Oh my gosh, we are so excited to have you here. Um, I I love Grandchester, and I can't believe we're on season eight. Neither can I. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, for people who are maybe unfamiliar with the series of James Runsey's books, mm. the Grandchester Mysteries, Sydney Shapers, Subsequent Adventures, can you briefly summarize the premise of Runsey's works? Yeah, it's a it's a very sort of simple premise, really. It's um, a detective duo, but we have a sort of embittered, uh, angry cop who is, thinks very black and white, um, and a vicar who works with him, who is who sees the world in all shades of grey. And for James Runcie based it. I don't know whether you knew this. Based it on his father, um, who was Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, who actually was the man who officiated over Princess Diana and Charles's wedding all those years ago. Um, so obviously James had a very invest, uh, vested interest in that kind of area. And, um, and he, you know, he brought some real knowledge of what it was like to grow up in the clergy. Um, and so it's about the insight a vicar can bring to a criminal investigation because all areas of the human heart are there, 
are their remit. So they bring something very interesting to a criminal drama. So while inspired by Runcie's books, Grangchester has been without Reverend Sidney Chambers since the fourth season and has really departed quite a bit from the original narrative. What challenges and freedoms have you encountered as you carved this new space for a vicar to solve mysteries with Detective Jordy Keating? It was, do you know what? It was, it was a, it was a challenge, but it was also a pleasure because James Runcie, who, if you ever get to meet him, is the loveliest man. He was very, <laughs> very kindly said, "Create who you want, create who, who you would like to be in the series," and he allowed us that freedom. And we knew, in a way, you have a blueprint print for this show. You have this kind of, you have to have a vicar and a detective who kind of get on, who are, who are buddies. So that was, you know, we started from that, but we knew we wanted to make him different. So. Will is a different generation to Sydney. He's he's younger. He's not lived through the war. He's not fought. So instantly that puts him and Georgia at a different kind of level. And, and in a way, they became father and son, which was a really nice um, a relationship to explore, really. So that's that was our starting point. Um, and we made him quite a complex character, much like Sydney. We knew he was probably going to be a bit troubled because they always are. Uh, <laughs> and they, they always have demons, all the vicars. Um, and, you know, we just, uh, when we met Tom Brittany, who plays Will, he, he just brought that to life and he added another dimension to it. So it's kind of a collaborative process, really. I mean, I will say a motorcycle riding vicar is not what I expected. <laughs> which is <laughs> Yeah, we're just making sexy. That's what we try to do. <laughs> so there's no shortage of murder, mystery, or mayhem in uh, Cambridgeshire village of Grangchester. Um, where do you get the ideas for the, the murder mysteries to solve? Well, we get them, well, we started very much on James Runcie's books. So there was a wealth of storylines there. But then since then, we tend to get the stories from everywhere, really. We, um, the news, I've re realized a lot of, the, the way the world is, like when the pandemic happened, there were a lot of stories that were very sort of claustrophobic stories or, you know, now with uh, the war in Ukraine, there are a lot of stories about Russia and the, and spying and, it, you know, intrigue. So I think you're affected by the outside world. And then I'll also, um, where I am at the moment is a little village and there are, there's always a lot of intrigue going on in little villages. So I, <laughs> I'm just stealing from real people's lives, honestly. <laughs> Yes, sometimes the truth is is a better entertainment than oh, yeah. sure, <laughs> always. <laughs> uh, Grangchester it explores faith, forgiveness, and redemption. How do you weave these? I mean, they're crucial, universal themes, and in every episode, you somehow brilliantly weave these themes. How do you do it? And do you think, oh, these need to be woven in or does it just come second nature at this point? Ooh. So that's an interesting question. I, I, I think a lot of it comes from the characters. Once you've created a, a character like Sydney, well, you know, as James did, or a character like Will, it, it, those themes come through them. They come through their, with their compassion and their, their nuance. They, they view even, they love the sinner they hate the sin. You can you can have those two things in conjunction. Two things can be true at once. So it's always about character for me. But we also, every series, we start with a blank piece of paper, literally a blank piece of paper on a wall. And um, and we work out the theme for our series. So and it will always be a sort of biblical theme like uh, season eight is redemption, very much about redemption and forgiveness and self-forgiveness. Um, the first series was about how can you live a Christian life when you've just lived and lived through the hell of war? So you, you kind of we find these big themes and then we try and resonate off those. And it, it gives you a lovely sort of backbone for your series, really, to ha have all those kind of interesting themes running through them. Oh, it's really interesting to think about. So you start with a blank piece of paper and you're yeah. like, this is going to be our theme. And then you carve out what you're thinking the various episodes would be. Yeah, sure. And so we'll work out, we'll, we'll generally start with Will and Geordie as the main characters, what their journeys are going to be across six or eight episodes, depending on, and then we'll, and we'll try and fit those stories around a theme. So Will, Will's theme, without giving too much away, is very much about how do you forgive yourself when you think you've done an unforgivable thing? That That's his journey. And Geordie's is, is sort of linked to that in terms of 
helping his friend learn forgiveness. It's, it, so then you, you it's quite fun, actually, because then once you have a theme, stories seem to spring out from that. You know, it's quite exciting. They suddenly appear <laughs> as if by magic kind of thing. And then suddenly the blank piece of paper isn't blank anymore, which is very nice. And do you work with a whole team for yeah. that? We we tend to keep the team small, actually. We have um, Emma Kingsman Lloyd, who is a, a brilliant executive producer. We've worked on it since season one. So it'll be her and Richard Cookson, who is a writer, and we'll sit in a room. And it's very, I find um, the American system sounds quite terrifying because I think you you sit in rooms for months and, you know, there's, there's lots <laughs> of intense chats. And we tend to... Uh, they tend to be sweets and donuts. They tend to be, we'll, um, we'll kind of, we'll all come with ideas and we sometimes might play music from that year or, you know, put up some pictures from that year just to try and get influence. We'll have a nice lunch. <laughs> we tend to, we tend, there tend to be a lot of food items in our story learning. <laughs> I tell you, donuts, lunch and music, I'm there. I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm just in the wrong country, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good fun. <laughs> You know, you have Grand Chester shining a spotlight on the humanity of clergy. I grew mm -hmm. up very religious. Ah. Um, and and it was it's really interesting. It was interesting for me to watch the various seasons over time because the the humanity of of clergy really really comes across. Yeah. Um, and the fact that clergy people make mistakes. How have your experiences or beliefs influenced your work? It's really interesting because um, I I am not a person of faith. I grew up in a um, quite a sort of conventional British, you know, the, it, I went to a Church of England school and there was a vicar and, you know, you went to church services. Um, my granddad was a vicar, actually. So it was sort of around my family. And but I, I personally didn't take that on board. But I'm always really envious of people who do have faith because I think it's a lovely peaceful calming thing to have and I think as a writer I sort of I, I put all that longing really into my scripts and I think that the religion I I am drawn to the sort of faith I'm drawn to is the very compassionate kind where where like you say you can you know, people make mistakes that human we're human and um, I like to believe if there is a god that he is a forgiving God and a kind God and an understanding God. And that's sort of what I put in my vicars to try and make them, you know, to try and make them care for people and not just judge. I, I don't, I think judgment is a very scary thing and, and people don't respond to it necessarily. Oh, for sure. And I think you, you are very successful, right? The, there is different moments in throughout the various seasons where it really comes across the, the role of being, of comfort and listening yeah. and being there. And it's just, so, it's so beautiful and um, reassuring on some level, right? Yeah. That, that there's someone in society um, that's there for that. And, you know, in your scripts, they really bring attention to the, the clergy's unique role in society. Multiple, yeah. Do you want to speak to that? And oh, no, sorry, I'm totally jumping in. <laughs> yeah. It does. They have, they have a very specific role and I find it really interesting especially when you put them in in a in a story about crime or murder or something you know quite so heinous and big people feel they can talk to vicars in a way they possibly don't feel they can speak to a police officer so you you instantly have somebody who is a confidant who who is not going to judge you and I find that I know I find it comforting that there are those people out there still and that um and that now we can have women ones as well <laughs> <laughs> Um, that is comforting. <laughs> Actually, that in itself is comforting. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of my my questions, though, is sometimes as I was watching this show, I almost thought that there there were ethical issues of mm -hmm. revealing information that was told in a confidential space. Um, how did how do you how did you wrestle with that as a writer? You know, here the vicar is getting information regarding a crime and and then feels obligated often to share it with Jordy. Um, and is that a, is that an ethical question or is, is is it always the answer to do what is right? I mean, you say hate the right, hate the the sin, not the sinner. Um, yeah. But what is that like? that yeah. go between or how do you how do you decide it's a tricky one and we we explored it in different ways through the characters so Sydney was very much I mean he 
he wasn't a good secret keeper, let's put it that way. You know, the first, the first chance he got, he was off to the police station to tell to tell what he knew. Whereas Will very much believed in the sort of the seal of the confessional. And I know we sort of associate that with um, the Catholic Church more than we do with the Anglican Church. But but there is that still that that um, privacy and that that sense of a story shared must be kept. But for Will, it's much more of a dilemma because, in fact, the first time you meet Will, he's in in a prison cell because Geordie's put him there because he won't tell what he knows. So instantly, it's a dilemma for him. And I think it was really nice to explore that. But I, I, for me, it's about if somebody's in danger, you share. And if if a child is in danger or, you know, somebody's life is in danger, that's the moment, that's the line you cross, I think. But I imagine it's different for all clergymen, I, I, I imagine, and women, <laughs> obviously. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, no, I, I think that that question of, it's an ethical question, right? And I think your your definition that you really explore throughout the, throughout the series is, it helps the viewer to question the role within society. Yeah. Um, so my question for you is a little bit going back to team, your team. Mm -hmm. Have you had the same team of writers throughout? Is that you shared a little bit about your, your season eight team. Was that the same for season seven or was there, you know, does it change up every season? How, how does, how does that work? We tend to, we're very lucky actually, we tend to keep writers. And it, for example, Richard Cookson, lovely guy, he's writing on, he's writing two episodes on season eight. He started off as a script editor. So he started off behind the scenes in season one and then he worked his way up, he became a producer so he was on set and now he's back to writing. So it's it basically, it's a weird, Grantchester, everyone you speak to about Grantchester will say, it's like a family. We we hang out together, we chat together. We, um, and if you, if, you, if you join the team early on, we'll keep you on and, and, and push you up. And so we've got writers from the first series. Um, other writers have gone on to, you know, to be too famous for us now. <laughs> no, they've gone off to do their own things, but we're very lucky that we tend to keep people and, and Emma and I and the actors, we all we all treat people like once you're in, you're in, you're, you're one of us. That sounded a bit mafia, but, you know, in a good way. <laughs> well, but but it's funny, right, on some level, because I feel that that sense of family is something you're so successful at creating oh, with, within the, the, the series, within all of the episodes. And it's also what keeps the viewer coming back, right? We almost feel, we feel part of the family too. And we want to know what's happening to our vicar and what's happening at the police station with, with Jordy. So um, season seven ends with, with vicar Will Davenport marrying um, Bonnie, which is yeah. a widowed younger sister of Jordy, which, you know, every, I mean, I was so excited. And finally, Will, who, you know, was a young bachelor trying to find his way has, been grounded by this amazing strong woman yes where do you plan to take us if you can tell us any little teasers in season eight I will try not to spoil anything but for us she, he's found the love of his life put it that way so they're in a very happy place at the beginning of season eight um that we just loved when we met Bonnie, when um, the actress um, came on to the set, we just loved her. She's she's a joy. She's a joyous person, a joyous character. And um, yeah, and they just clicked together as people in real life and on screen. And we were so lucky. So season eight begins with them. They are. He's grown up. He's grown up. He's got a, a wife. He's got a stepson. He's oh, I was about to reveal something. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe there might be more family on the way, put it that way. Um, <laughs> and it's 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 joyous and it's it's a lovely place to be with an with a grown-up man now rather than a man child, which is what he was. Um and so we but being Grantchester, we always have to test people a little bit. And so by the end of episode one, Will will be sort of thrown off on an entirely different journey. But Bonnie will be by his side. So well, for those of you who are just joining us, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. You're watching PBS Books, and I am so fortunate to be here with Daisy Coulomb, who is the the writer, creative uh, creator, executive producer of Grantchester, and we are here discussing season eight. And if you're just joining us, you might want to rewind just a bit because she just revealed a little bit about what you might see in season eight. Okay. 
So Daisy, back to the conversation. I've read a little bit. Season eight explores the lives of invisible women. Mm -hmm. Why was this topic important for you to include? Throughout the series, actually, we've looked at invisible women. I mean, it's the 1950s and we're heading into the 60s, but women still were only housewives. They were cleaners. You know, they, they, they were the lowest of the low in a sense. They, they, it was a, well, it still is a bit of a patriarchal society, but then even more so. And, and we wanted to explore through a guest, some of the guest stories, these women who are overlooked and are starting to find their voice. And I think we have Bonnie who is, she's, she's quite modern in that sense. She's, she's starting to find her voice. She's not happy just being a vicar's wife. You know, she wants more for her life. But we also have a guest story where we meet some, some rather naughty students who, who uh, are making their voices heard, put it that way. They're, they're um, standing up for women's rights and women's bodies. And um, it's sort of exciting time because, you know, 1960s, things are changing and it's nice to see that women are, are starting to stand up to the men and make themselves heard, really. So, yeah. Interpersonal relationships throughout the series have been a really important component, as we talked about a little bit before about family, the importance of family and what a family looks like. How does this, well, maybe we can talk about one of your favorite relationships um, that exists in season eight. What was interesting, I was thinking about this the other day, and I love all their relationships because they've all, it's all, it's all evolved. But for me, a very interesting one, this series is um, Jack, who is Mrs. C's quite conservative older husband who, you know, moneyed and I would imagine a little bit right wing. And um, his friendship with Leonard, who is now openly gay. And, um, and but they, they have a wonderful conversation in this series where they talk about love and what love means to them. And I, and I really, moved me because it, what I realized is these characters have evolved so Jack was in series one and and Leonard was in the closet in series one and now here they are two very different people sitting down and talking about love and what it means to them and I just I love that they keep surprising me actually these characters they just keep yeah they come out with their own things sometimes you're like where did that come from <laughs> <laughs> Leonard is a character so many people love I mean he is yeah. he's um gone on such a, such a journey um, and really grown into his own. And now he has a new vocation. Mm. Does it present unexpected challenges that you can talk about? Yes, it really does. Because in a way, so last series, Leonard was um, working in a cafe and he'd, he'd made this decision to um, set himself up as an entrepreneur, but it wasn't enough for him, you know, making tea and reading bad poetry wasn't enough. He needed he needed something that was more like the church, more like his vocation. And I think he's found it now. He's helping people, basically. He's helping those people in society that are overlooked. And it's, yeah, it's going to be a struggle. And it's going to bring him into some contention with the law. But it's the, yeah, this series is the making of Leonard, I think. It's it's him finding his voice too, in a way. You know, the the un. The, the, the quiet people in society are starting to find their voice. Hmm. Let's go back and talk about family a little bit. Oh, so <laughs> we've talked about it. We have, but if you, you know, I definitely, how do you define family? Because I feel that family is ever evolving and even for different characters, it's evolving differently. So what are you seeing and what is your strategy or do they just, do the characters almost invent themselves on this journey? Yeah, I think they do, but I think there's something very interesting about a church, which is a collection of people, sometimes lonely people, sometimes people without their own families, and they come to this place and they feel like they belong. And I suppose with this show, that's what we wanted to create, a family a family of, in a way, a family of misfits and people who, who have been rejected by their families like Leonard and Daniel, or don't have a family like Mrs. C. And then you sort of bring them together. And I think people do that. I think people in life do that. They you find your family sometimes. Sometimes the family you're given aren't, aren't the right one and you find the ones who will love you for who you are. And that and that's what this show is to me. I always, I always look forward to revisiting them when I come back to write them because they're just, yeah, they're a little family of their own, really. Mrs. C, this is someone I think um, we all love. I mean, you know, it's hard not to. She's black and white. It's good or it's bad, but then... <laughs> 
She loves Leonard even, right? And she struggles. She struggles with herself, within herself. Can we expect that she'll be a large part of season eight? How is she doing? Anything you can share? She is, well, she's sort of the matriarch now of, of our of our misfit family. And she she's very, as you say, very, she loves Leonard and she wants him to do well. This This season, she might meddle a little bit because now she's got Jack and they have money she sees Leonard's business business his his vocation as a business opportunity so she she's she puts her oar in a bit I would say and 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 starts to meddle a little bit um but she always means well and and she will always be there for her boys I think that's the main thing she you know she loves them like sons so yeah the stories um, in Grinchester season eight, at least what I've been able to read and find online, um, episodes, they involve everything from a speedway racing to Cold War spying. Can you share a little bit about one of your favorite stories and its evolution and how you approached the research for the episode? Yeah. So, for example, the um, the university story where we have these girls who are protesting against um, a painting, which is shows a nude woman, and they're saying, "How is it that men are okay with women lying naked on a picture, but they they make us dress? You know, they make us cover up because we're too provocative." That story started um, from James Runcie's book, actually, a book we, we we went back and revisited any stories we hadn't done, and his story was about a a, a the kind of stealing of a painting. Um, and it was, uh, the distraction was a naked woman. And we thought, how can we make this a 60s story? How can we make this? So we took that, we took, you know, hashtag me too. We took the, the, the kind of zeitgeist, I suppose, around at the time, at now is basically that, you know, women are starting to, again, speak out about these things in a way we've never been able to before. So we combined those two stories, um, combined those two elements and, um, we've got a wonderful story about that, which, um, funnily enough, is directed by Al Weaver, who plays Leonard, who oh, wow. uh, directorial debut. So he's a uh, he. Um, yeah, he had fun. <laughs> That's so awesome. I love that. <laughs> Are there any other um, surprises of um, people taking on different roles, whether it's a writer maybe appearing in a in one of the episodes is there any any other like crossover you said it was a big family is there anything else you can think of of yeah, someone I'm crossing over there's always there's always a bit if you um look in the church services there will always be at least one person that um Richard has been in um Cookson the one of the writers he's been in a few scenes he was um in, in an episode about um voting that he was talking about his dahlias and you know like you, you kind of go oh look there's somebody's mum uh or you know Tom who plays Will he, he's got his dad on set occasionally um Tom has directed his own episode um yeah everyone sort of it's great because it's sort of not a free-for-all but it's it's a sense that if you're interested in something we'll let you go there and and Al and Tom have both done amazing jobs directing really really good really yeah. interesting that Good. Is sounded really like patronizing, but they, they really did. They, they brought such a, you know, a, a kind of brilliant depth to the series. Yeah. Lovely. Well, and it's also it's extraordinary, like for I at least I think for someone to be able to explore their different interests um, and to grow as as a as a professional, too. Yeah. I mean, it's so I, I think that that what an what an, an amazing opportunity you'll probably get a lot more applications next time you have it. <laughs> no thing call. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Anyone else? <laughs> um, well, this has been tremendous, and and we are so excited to be able to talk more with you. I always like to ask my my writers and the people I talk to, what else, what are you currently working on? Ah, um, a lot of things uh, that may or may not get made, as is the case in our business. Um, but I'm doing, I'm working on the thing about the Brontes and I'm working on a murder mystery, a true crime, quite a lot of crime, actually. I do like a bit of crime. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I like a bit of variety as well, but I always like coming back to Grantchester, actually, as why we always say it's our happy place. And it, yeah, it really is. Besides um, Runcie's books, do mm -hmm. you have a favorite murder mystery author? 
Oh, that's a very good one. I tell you what, I'm really, I'm really into um, true crime at the um, true crime books, and um, I recently reread In Cold Blood, and it is the most amazing book. And if anyone hasn't read it, just read it now because it's so, it's it's just so chilling and so beautifully told. It's sort of, it's sort of poetic how it's. I mean, Truman Capote could do no wrong in my eyes, but. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, revisit that because it's so good. It's like it's it's kind of the start of everything. I think the start of our obsession with true crime. Hmm. So one of the things I also like to ask writers um, is if they have a favorite library. Now, obviously, your favorite library. Well, I won't say obviously. It might not be in England, but I'm thinking it probably is. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite library? I do. When I was little, um, we used to go to. It's called Ride Library. It's on the. I, I'm, I grew up on an island, a small island off the coast of England. Um, a very small place and the local librarian she gave me a little um library librarian badge and I she used to let me stamp the books and um she she really she used to give me books every Christmas with her name inscribed in them Brenda her name was um and when she died she gave me some money to um to you know do she wanted she kind of pushed children to to explore their imaginations and I think she was partly why I got into writing so I mean it was it's a nothing library if you visited it it's no you know there's not like it's just an old you know 1960s building but it I think it started my love with books and 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 love with authors and writers so yeah well that's extraordinary and I think that there is probably a story in there right the, yeah. the amount of people I talked to I mean your story in particular the fact that this librarian made such an impact and difference on your life it's so wonderful and I think for for us all to think about those those people those librarians who make such a difference um in, in our lives yeah I must say I found a photo the other day of me in my at the librarian's desk with my little stamp so I'll send that to you. <laughs> oh, I would, oh I would love that can I can we post it on social too? Oh yeah sure, sure. <laughs> I love Absolutely. it. Well this has been extraordinary um before we close the conversation are there any last thoughts or takeaways for the audience about the upcoming season in Grantchester? Oh it's going to be emotional I would say and um but there's always warmth and heart. So just when you think things are looking sad, don't worry. It will all be fine. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, those are good words for me, especially because I'm always on, on the edge of my chair, like scared. <laughs> okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, this has been lovely. Thank you so much for your time, for your insights, yeah. uh, but most importantly for your work. I mean, it is, it, it, I, I've just enjoyed Grantchester so much and I know season eight, which I have not yet seen, will be as fabulous, if not more fabulous than all the other seasons. Um, and we look forward to hopefully having you on again soon. <laughs> oh, yeah, lovely. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Well, for all of you out there, we just want to thank our library partners, um, more than 1,800 strong, as well as numerous PBS stations around the country. Most importantly, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us. If you have a moment, explore exclusive uh, Grandchester content online from all seven seasons, including cast interviews, filming locations, details, surprising facts about stars, and more. You can also browse through video shorts um, and that has episode scenes, behind the scene cast conversations. It's just tons of fun. Um, you can go to pbs.org and type in Grantchester. Um, well, in case you forget, this Sunday, July 9th at 9 p.m., excuse me, yes, at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Grandchester premieres. So don't miss it. And until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. Happy reading. <laughs>